helpful. Thank you very much. Um, so I recognise a couple of faces in the room, but not many. And I'll just let you know, I'm Heather Clarkson. I'm the Walk Derbyshire lead. And if I could ask you to start putting yes, your name and where you're from in the link in the chat at the side, that'd be really, really helpful. So we know who's in the room. Um, just a couple of ground rules for you. Just if you're not speaking, if you can keep your lines on mute to keep the echoing down. If you do want to speak, put your hands up. Uh, and somebody in the room, uh, Nikki or myself, will notice and come to you. Um, we are going to be using a Mentimeter later, so there's a bit of an interactive section. So if you can keep your chat on, that's really helpful because Nikki will be putting the link to the Mentimeter on at certain points. I think we've got four Mentimeters, uh, and hopefully they they're, they're ready to give us a flavour of how we're getting on throughout the the call today. Um, yeah, also use the chat at any time for any questions or comments and we can come back to them as well. That'd be really helpful. So I'm going to ask, first of all, people are putting their names in. That's really helpful. Thank you very much. Nikki, would you show the first Mentimeter? So the first question um, to open us up today, uh, so we everybody knows what, what page we're all on, is why is walking important to you personally or in your work? And hopefully we'll be able to see uh, people's comments as it comes on. Do we have a do we have a link for Mentimeter and a code to get in? I've just uh, yeah, it's just in the chat. In the chat. All oh, right, yeah, lovely. Thank you. So why is walking important to you personally or in your work? Or if you want to say both, then that's absolutely fine as well. Brilliant. I walk every day in the parks in Erewash and it's so important for my mental health. Yeah. It's free. Enables us to keep fit, get to places and has so many wider benefits. Walking helps us absorb information. I'm a co-lead on children's healthier weight for Derbyshire. And this when we're talking about walking as well, we're just we're talking about being outside and be, being active as well. So um, I value the impact it has for me personally on my physical and mental health and enables me to connect, to be connected to my local community. These are all really positive responses. I work with walk volunteers who lead health walks in Erewash as well as training walk lead volunteers. Personally, I enjoy walking and being around nature. I enjoy getting out in the fresh air and prefer walking to any other form of transport. I didn't write that, but that could have more or less been my response as well. So <laughs> we have some similar heads in the room. That's really good. Are there any more coming in, Nikki? Can you tell? I'm not sure. I can't tell. No, I've just, yeah, I can only see what you can see at the moment, I think. Brilliant. That's OK. That's a really good range of responses. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'll just give you a quick overview of, of how today is going to run, just so you all have it in your head. Um, going to show a short video initially, which is around what is Walk Derbyshire and what our systems approach is uh, to walking. Now, the reason it's a video is because we're doing eight of these online stakeholder events. So we want everybody to be having the same information in the same way. So I've done a, a video for that. Um, we will be recording, um, well, the video is recorded already, but we will be sending out the video and the slides afterwards. So if um, anybody misses out a, a little bit, then you can always catch up on that. Uh, so we'll be watching the short video. Then we're going to have a little uh, Mentimeter, um, which are, I won't ruin the surprise about what that's about. And then we're going to go into a breakout room around systems approach and, and what it means for you here in Erewash. Uh, then we'll have a little break, five minutes, and then I'm going to introduce uh, Scott, who's our Insight Partner from Press Red, waving beautifully at the top of my screen. Uh, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion about the data that Scott brings, any other local data that we um, have available to us, and then we'll talk about the next steps. So uh, before further ado, I will um, 
introduce Walk Derbyshire and our systems approach to you. Here's the video. If you, if somebody could just let me know that they can see it, that'd be really helpful. It's not on yet. Stop again. <laughs> this happened last time. I can. It's always there until it's not. Let's hope we don't have all the technical problems that we had in the first workshop. I know, yeah. <laughs> we had a stakeholder event this morning and we had a few IT issues there. Internet, my internet dropped just as I was about to start yeah. presenting. <laughs> it couldn't have been much worse timing, really. I think I'm going to have to show my window again, I'm afraid. So I think that means that the unlucky person who happens to say the last thing gets shown on my screen as I play it. So everybody quiet. But it is to make everyday walk in the norm for all. Hold on. The vision of Walk Derbyshire is to make everyday walk in the norm for all residents of Derbyshire, with a focus on our inactive population and our disadvantaged communities. We want to create a culture of walking with an emphasis around walking with our own communities and from our own doorsteps. We know that walking contributes to the vast majority of physical activity. It's available and accessible to everyone. There's an undaunting entry level, especially for those who are inactive. We know the physical and mental health benefits to walking. And when we talk about walking, we're talking about walking for both travel and for leisure. And we do know that walking is a cheap and clean way to travel. There are a number of elements to how Walk Derbyshire will be delivered. Insight and evaluation. Insight's important to ensure we're driven by our current knowledge and gaps in that knowledge and what walking levels look like across Derbyshire between our different demographics and geographies. Press Red have been commissioned to complete bespoke walking insight packs, which will be shared with you today with the aim to help guide conversations around how, where and who you can influence to walk more. Evaluation is important to capture and share learning on successes and things that could have gone better with a wider audience and to help us to iteratively change our approach to Walk Derbyshire. Leeds Beckett University are our Walk Derbyshire evaluation partners and they'll be embedding themselves into our work. A PhD student will be recruited to start in February 2023 and their initial focus will be on Walk Derbyshire. Communication and engagement. We need to build relationships across all sectors and with the communities that we work with. And we need to recognise the importance of co-production in everything that we do. When it comes to workforce, we need to make sure we're supporting them. Our workforce includes those who directly engage with people about walking to those who could advocate walking as part of their wider work. These could be people who are either paid or in voluntary roles. So what do they need to be able to enable people to walk more and how can we support them? As part of our work, Walk Derbyshire will invest across the county to enable us to evaluate and share learning around how we support our residents to walk more on an everyday basis. Chesterfield, Erewash, Bolsover and North East Derbyshire will have the opportunity to be active neighbourhood pilots. These are our four districts with the highest levels of inactivity and the highest levels of deprivation. And that will provide an opportunity for stakeholders to come together with their communities to agree on the best ways to invest funding on a place-based level to increase levels of walking. High Peak, Derbyshire Dales, South Derbyshire and Amber Valley will have the opportunity to be community engagement and co-production pilots. So that's working with the community to develop an understanding of the barriers and opportunities to support residents to walk more. Within our Walk Derbyshire pilots, there are some principles we aim to embed. They include tackling local inequality and working where the greatest need is. We need to ensure that targeted community engagement is embedded in co-creation, delivery and evaluation. We need to collaborate, share and learn across local priority places and share that learning across Derbyshire. We need to ensure that, ensure that we're looking at a systems approach, considering the widest range of influences and interactions. We need to ensure our practice is inclusive and that all our opportunities are available to anyone. We need to make sure we're connecting communities and ensuring people can access appropriate local opportunities. And we want to embed the Walk Derbyshire vision at a local level. Today's session will help support the pilots and moving on from this, each district and borough 
will look at developing a consortium who will develop their local bid and take the pilot work forward. The pilot work provides us with an opportunity for each district and borough to explore and develop a system approach to walking. I'm now going to hand over to James Cook, who will talk us through the complexities and benefits of a system approach to walking. Walk Derbyshire aims to adopt a systems approach to walking. It's important for us to develop a shared understanding of what system working means to us. A system is a way of thinking about the bigger picture. Systems thinking is less concerned with how an individual department or organisation operates, but more with how the connections, interactions and feedback between them help shape the outcomes we want to see. When considering the wider sectors that play a role in enabling people to move more, it includes partners such as health, community safety, voluntary community sector, business, highways, and many, many more. So why is taking a systems approach important for Walk Derbyshire? Physical inactivity, like many other social outcomes, is complex. By this, we mean there are a range of different factors that will impact upon whether a person is or isn't active. If we think about some of those different factors, for example, are there footpaths for people to walk on and what condition are they in? Are there main roads to cross? Are there planning applications around active travel and what do these include? And do people feel safe in their own communities? All of those different factors are interacting with each other in different ways at different times. And of course, when we talk with our communities to understand their lives, what's important to them and what would enable them to walk more, we need to remember that each, each individual and family unit will experience those factors in different ways. As with all complex issues, there isn't a single intervention or solution. There's not one organisation or individual that has the answers. Change requires collective action from across sectors at all layers. We need to work collaboratively with our communities and with different partners and different sectors to understand those factors impacting on whether people choose to walk and what does that mean for our collective action. So how do we know that we are working in complexity? Well, some of what we do will be simple, some of it will be complicated, and some of it will be complex. For example, we know that something is simple if by taking an action, we know that it will achieve the desired outcome. For example, if we switch a light switch on, we know that the light will come on. For something that is complicated, we know that if we take several actions, often expert steps, that it will achieve the desired outcome. For example, a mechanic will know that when fixing a car engine, that they need to take several steps, often in the right order, at the right time, to achieve that desired outcome. In terms of complexity, well, we know we are working in complexity when we do not know in advance if something will work. For example, just because something works in one community, it does not mean that it will work in another community or even that it would work in that same community a year down the line. It is important to recognise and understand when we are working in complexity. The good news is, that although we do not know in advance if something will work, we can plan for working in complexity. Key to this is setting up processes to enable us to learn quickly about what is working so that we can amplify it. And just as importantly, learn quickly about what doesn't work so that we can stop or adapt. As we've, as we've established around inactivity, we know that we are working in complexity. So we need to feel comfortable that the work is to explore experiment and learn together about how Walk Derbyshire can enable people to walk. That worked better than last time, so thank you. Me, I'm thanking myself. <laughs> um, yeah, so following on from that, we're going to go into a little bit of breakout rooms to discuss what a system approach would look like in Erewash. Um, I think probably three three breakout rooms based on the amount of people here, yeah. Um, and before we do, I'm just going to ask you to just do this uh, Mentimeter again. At this what time, which system partner do you represent? That will help us get a bit of a visual around who's in the room today. And again, the, the links in the side.
just to let people know, my same questions come up. If you refresh um, using the circle, it should bring up the new question. Brilliant. Error wash for a council. Active Derbyshire, uh, Benelit Viaduct, Errorwash Borough Council again. I'm presuming EBC it stands for Errorwash Borough Council. Yep. Uh, an enabler, DCC Public Health uh, Charity, which is Benelit ben Viaduct. I think adult education, ICB Derby and Derbyshire. Brilliant. Fantastic. I think that probably might be around everybody who's in that room. So that, it moves around. So uh, I got in there quickly. Oh, Age UK, brilliant, Derbyshire Dales. And hmm, what does that stand for? Age UK, DD, SNF. Strictly no fall then. Is it Derbyshire Dales as well? Derbyshire, Derby and Derbyshire. It wouldn't let me fit oh. it all in. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Brilliant. Fab. Thank you very much. So we're going to go into breakout rooms. Um, Scott. Uh, myself and Jade will facilitate them. So we'll do 15 minutes of a bit of discussion, then we'll we'll come back and, and feed back to the room for about five minutes. Uh, and then we'll have a quick five minute break. So I think Nikki will allocate us our breakout rooms. You'll be instantly transported to another room with new people very shortly. And then there is a bit of a countdown. And when you've got 30 seconds left, it really does mean it because it will just kick you straight back out into the room. So be prepared. I think I've assigned everyone, so I'm just going to open the open the rooms. Just might oh. take a minute for people's invite to come through. Thanks, Nika. Uh, sorry that everyone else needs admitting back. You get back in, they need admitting. <laughs> oh. Is everyone back, Nikki? Yeah. Brilliant. I'll tell you what we're talking about been active and walking here we've all just been to different rooms and not had to move from our chairs so uh what's that tell you about about us we'll change that next time <laughs> um thank you everybody's back we've had it we've we've had a really interesting discussion in my room um i'll quickly uh summarize what we spoke about and then i'll go to jade if i can to summarize your room and then scott to summarize yours and then we'll have a quick break so in my room, um, we had Isabel, um, Economic Development Officer from Erewash Borough Council. We had Kate from Benley Viaduct, uh, Katz Patterson from Erewash Voluntary Action, and Penny from Public Health Erewash. So we had a really nice mix of people there. Um, we really talked about it. So we talked about uh, how a system approach currently works in Erewash and, and the thought really is that we have a lot of links in Erewash and there's lots going on and the, the links and the systems that do work together work very well together but then there's other stuff going on that not everybody's aware of and it's understanding what people are doing and linking into it and then there was a little bit of a discussion about people not being sure where they fit either because they they're not linking into everything yet or because they don't really appreciate where walking into fits into their agenda um we talked about some barriers and, and 
values really were around behavior change change and motivation and interestingly penny spoke about some resident engagement she'd done where uh, people in a certain area just said we, we aren't interested in activity if you're going to talk about activity then we're going to shut the door on you basically so we talked about then how do we badge it up for that for that community so it's right for that community and thinking in those ways um everybody in, in my session agreed that walking was important for for their agenda and it, and it is the easiest way into activity but we just need to make sure that we join it up with all the other work that's going on as well we didn't get as far as the question around who isn't here who should be so i will pass over on to jade thank you very much and um, we also had a very interesting um conversation so um, in our room, we had Rosemary, who is one of the programme development officers for adult education locally. Um, Joe Briggs from Age UK um, at Strictly No Fallen. Um, Dan from Erie Washborough Council um, in the com Community Health and Wellbeing Development Team. And Aya, who's one of the community activators in the same team as Dan working locally in Kirk Hallam. Um, I think we probably had two halves of a conversation, if if that's a fair way to reflect it, in in terms of, I guess, reflecting on the the breadth of what a whole systems approach really looks like and the complexities and, and how big and overwhelming that kind of seemed in the first instance. So how do we really take those steps to understand the organisations um, and individuals, kind of what their motivations are, what their connections are, some of, I think, what you were just reflecting on, Heather. Um, but then really looking at it from an individual's perspective. Um, so a, a great question from Jo as, as ever is, what is walking? Um, in the force prevention class she's been doing this morning, people have been on their feet standing, doing versions of walking and how do people have the confidence to do that? And and just thinking about that and also then reflecting at a community level and I are bringing in some of the experiences around Kirk Hallam, around how accessible are some of those spaces reflecting on the pavements and, and that link back to kind of what Joe was just saying, um, but really recognising on the doorstep of that community, the instant access into those green spaces and are they utilised um, by people that live there? So so that kind of really looking at that broader space and, and kind of thinking where to start um, into that individual, right down to an individual level. So yeah, some really good starting points. Well, you managed to go from it being a very, very broad thing to then managing to narrow it down from top to bottom. So that's <laughs> well done. Um, Scott, do you want to update on your room? Uh, yeah, can do. Um, I had uh, Kathleen, I, I think I've got these right. I could easily have got them wrong with the way they started off. I put I put up the question from Erewash. I forgot to delete uh, the South Derbyshire bit of the question earlier. So we were in the wrong place to begin with. But there we go. We got there in the end. I, I had Kathleen, who's a community connector um, at the council. I had Marie, who works around children and young people um, and long term conditions. Adrian, who's a resident and service user and Jane from Public Health. Hopefully I've got everybody there. We had a really interesting conversation around um, the need for collaboration, you know, just look at the the stakeholder map from this little room of people that this workshop's managed to reach. And it's already getting quite complicated, isn't it, with all of these different organisations that can contribute to, to helping people to, to walk and move more. So we had a conversation about the need to expand that and that's what it's all about is bringing everybody in including residents i think that was a really strong um, um message in in our conversation you know that statutory organizations community organizations and we also talked about the private sector we had a really interesting little bit about how some of the gyms local gyms have car parks that are very full um, and all of that side of things um and and then thinking about trying to just bring all of the things that are happening together you know if, if we can and grow awareness of them we had a little bit of a conversation about barriers in terms of um, getting more, getting and hearing from more residents around what the problems are and what gets in the way. Um, being conscious of our language, um, you know, walking, it's a very, you know, what term in one way, isn't it? For some people that can't, aren't able to do it, you know, we need to understand whether that's, whether it's the appropriate language for us to be using. So I think there's something in there that we need to be be, be considering um, that what we need to do is across all ages and abilities. Um, and so there's a need to be thinking about the challenge of doing that when we've got such a um, a, a sizable challenge as I'll get onto in, in terms of the data in a, in, a, in, a, in a bit. I think there's a really beautiful, I can't remember who said it, um, but we I think it might have been Jane that talked about 
the gatekeepers in organisations protecting what it is that they have got responsibility for and not being open to changing because they might not be directly benefiting from the investment. I think that's a great thing to put into this meeting straight away. And, and, and we know that that's a challenge and we've got to think about how we're going to work through that because I think it's really important. We then had a, com a little bit of a conversation around um, people that aren't in here. So we talked about um, other, more people that are running community groups, people from the built environment, uh, planning, transport, green spaces, some of the larger local uh, private businesses. Um, you know, we've, we've touched on the gym and leisure centres bit, chambers of commerce, um, live long, uh, I always get this, bet, live life better, Darvish, have I got that right? Yes, yes. Um, and then, and then, you know, find the people that hold the money, you know, the, and the potentially is a, a challenge around the, 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 the perceptions of investment, talked about schools, so on and so forth. So, yeah, it was a really good conversation. That's brilliant. Thanks, Scott, and everybody else that was in the groups as well. I think we've managed to there when we've all been doing our discussions, we've managed to touch on everybody who really is involved in the system from the from the strategic leads, the, the purse string holders down to uh, the most important people, which is the residents. Um, so I think that was probably a really helpful conversation. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to take us into a quick five minute break. So feel free to just turn your cameras and your microphones off and um, get a refreshment. And when we come back, I will introduce a quick uh, Mentimeter about where we're expecting this work to take us and then um, bring Scott in from Fresh Red to talk about our data. So, um, yeah, if you all want to come back at 10 to 2, that would be great. I shall see you there.
really hard to tell when everybody's back when when people don't have cameras on in cities it quite quite rightly don't turn your cameras on if you don't want them on i'm just uh, just saying it's difficult i'm just going to assume in one minute that most people are back and nikki you're being very prepared well done thank you i think we'll assume people are back so thank you all for coming back it's always a good sign um i am about to hand over to scott to talk through some of the erewash specific data hopefully he won't show the south derbyshire one like it but both me and him did in our <laughs> in our breakout session so we do apologize for that um yeah but first of all if we can just to, to try and lead us into scott's data a little bit of a mentimeter around what are your expectations from from the walk derbyshire work we can just get that started there whilst people are doing that heather uh, I've got a further technical issue. I've just been informed by my computer that my mouse is about to die. <laughs> so I, I've got it plugged in at the moment. Hopefully that it will charge enough for me to get through the presentation. Otherwise, I'll be rapidly trying to find out how to do keyboard <laughs> controls and changing my slides. I think if not at the bottom of each pe person's uh, screen, they can manually forward their slides oh. on. So if we need to, we can just get people to manually do it. OK. OK. Or I can share them. It's up to you. Well, let's see how it goes. Yeah. I've got it plugged in while we do the Mentor Beach. It might be enough charge to get me through it. <laughs> Fingers crossed. So uh, what is your expectation from this work? Great one here, co-production. Um, to make those connections to the wider health conversations, uh, to better inform the approach. Uh, for people, partners, organisations to come together to support people across Erewash to Mook War in a walk more in a way that works for them. Uh, working with all aspects of the community to increase walking for all ages and abilities. I tell you what this is doing, making me realise I need to go for an eye test. Um, for there to be greater understanding of the work that others are doing, how we can better support local people so that organisations and people can know what we're doing walk wise and that we aren't overlapping or conflicting with, with each with other organisations. Brilliant. Uh, I'd like to understand what physical barriers People have to walk in and move in. I'd like to connect regeneration to what people want and need, maybe. Uh, making walking more inclusive. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good one. And some of the, the work we're hopefully going to be doing moving forward is about inclusivity and getting a bit of a, a an inclusion toolkit, maybe with different scenarios. So that's brilliant. Um, I will hand over to Scott um, now. If you have any issues, Scott, do shout up. Let, let's get the pack up first and, and hope it works. We all see that. Yeah, everybody can see it. Good. That's a good start. Hopefully my mouse doesn't run out of batteries halfway through. Um, Thank you everyone for joining us. I have got about 25, 30 minutes just to try and bring some data to life around um, what walking behaviour looks like in, in Erewash. And I'm hopefully going to post some questions, provoke some thinking around the direction that the, the, the this Walk Derbyshire investment can, can take us in. I was really pleased to see on that last slide that there was quite a lot of comments about learning, understanding, knowing more, rather than jumping into putting in solutions in place. So that's that's a great starting point to, to be kind of dropping this information, um, in, in, to share all of this information with you. So I'm gonna start by just giving a little bit of context in terms of the broader physical activity picture. Um, and so what you're looking at here is um, 
every year there is a survey for of adults physical activity behavior um, that happens across the whole of the country and it is about 500 people on a rolling basis in Erewash respond to this survey um, and what you've got here is two things the red dotted line at the bottom is the proportion of people that are of adults that are inactive in Erewash um, what does inactive mean this is this is a part of our population that is doing less than 30 minutes physical activity in the week. OK, and you can just see for each of the six years of data what it's been like. And you can see as when the pandemic hit, you can see how inactivity rose considerably. Positively, it's bounced back in, in, in era wash, which is a good situation to be in to, to start with. The green line, uh, the black line, the, the red one over arches, that's just the data for England, just as a, there is a bit of a comparator. But England's a bit fair, unfair to compare error wash because demographically it looks very different. But it's there just as a, as, a, as a reference point, really. The green line at the top is the proportion of adults that are achieving 150 minutes of physical activity um, per week. And you can see that that dropped a little bit before the pandemic and has dropped again since. It hasn't had the same bounce back as inactivity has. What does that mean? That means we've got more people in the middle that are doing between 30 and 149 minutes. And that 150 minutes is the chief medical officer's recommendation around physical activity. Um, and the reason why I've kind of put this into the mix, because it's just important context for us to be thinking about um, uh, walking uh, data. Um, Adrian, are you, can you not see any slides at all? Uh, no, I've just got a blank black screen. Mm. Um, Scott, I <laughs> might just I'll send Adrian the slides. Yeah, that's, yep. that's yeah, if that's all right. Thanks, Heather. Um, so, so it's important for us because because walking, it well, it, it's the it's the way most people get most of their minutes. It's as simple as that. You know, if you if you were to put all of the minutes that everybody did for, through various activities together in a big pie, half of that pie would be minutes from walking. It's double more than any other activity. Activity. It's huge. If to put it in comparison, you get the, the population as a whole on average gets about six percent of its minutes from cycling, whereas you get about 50 percent of our minutes from walking. So it's really important. This, you know, it, it, to, to, to the way that we we are physically active. One of the challenges that we've had from Heather and Jade um, when we start to look at this walking data is to try and make sense of it in a way that helps us think about how often people walk. It's not as easy as you think, but we have done it to a degree, I hope. So, so what you've got here now, let me just explain the, the different blocks and what we've done. Um, we have basically broke walking frequency down into four types of behaviour. The chunk at the bottom, so nearly four in 10 people, uh, four in 10 adults in Erewash that are doing what we call not walking. And what do we mean by that? Well, four in 10 people are not doing one session of 10 minutes or more walking in the last 28 days. So that's the technical definition of it. So they're not getting to 10 minutes. They might be doing quite a, they might be doing a, a lot of minutes because they might be doing a lot of six or seven minute walks. Um, but they're not getting over that 10 minute threshold that we've used to kind of identify doing it, you know, being able to count it. Um, the group above that, well, they're doing up to two sessions a week or between one and seven sessions of 10 minutes or more in the last 28 days. The group above that are doing between eight and 27 sessions of 10 minutes or more in the last 28 days. And the top group, what we've called walking regularly, are doing 28 sessions in the last 28 days so you could think about that as daily walking but it's not as simple as that because we can't define that in the data some of those sessions may, might have been two or three on one day and then nothing the next day but those people are pretty regular walkers and are getting a lot of minutes from walking so we've analyzed the data both in terms of kind of trends but also in terms of different parts of our population and trying to get into localities to just uh, using these kind of four um, descriptions. And we're going to focus mainly on that group that's not walking and understanding who it is that isn't walking as much as they could be. What I just want to make the connection for before I get into the walking data a bit more, though, is I just want to make the connection between the first slide being active and walking. What you've got on here is the proportion, the, the bit, the red bit below the 
middle uh, middle line be below the definitions that's the proportion of inactive people so what it's telling us that for those that are not walking for those people that don't do one session of 10 minutes walking in the last 28 days 60 percent of that group are inactive so they fall within not doing 30 minutes over the uh, 30, 30 minutes a week so but when you start to walk a little bit, i.e. walking less regularly, so remember this is up to one or two times a week, up to seven times in 28 days, look at how that inactive group shrinks. So we get people walking a little bit, they get minutes and they either end up doing more walking or they get involved in other things and get minutes in other ways. So so getting people just do it away from doing no walking of 10 minutes and doing a little bit it would suggest that it leads to then people more likely be becoming active rather than being inactive. Just to explain the 27.8 on the left hand side. So that's the proportion of people who aren't walking, but get all of their 150 minutes or more from other activities. If we were to do an analysis of that group, it would probably be orientated towards men, young adults and higher socioeconomic groups. OK, that are probably going to rely on traditional sport or cycling or, or or fitness classes or they're going to the gym or whatever it is and getting their minutes that way. And actually they, they get to those places by driving. So they're not doing any uh, walking minutes. But we haven't studied that, but that's my, my 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 guess on what it looks like. So what this tells us is that if we can get people moving a bit, it's more likely they might move a little bit more. And that's good for our data overall in terms of activity levels. OK, what you've got here is those towers for, for error wash for the six years that we've got the data. And, and so you can start to see first three, four years just nudged up a little bit. If we're talking about that not walking group, went from 38.7 to 41.4 just before the pandemic. It then lifted up again in the early stage of the pandemic. But now it's dropped to the lowest data point that we've had, which is really positive. So that not walking group, but it's still nearly four in 10, you know, 38 percent of the population. It, it's still quite a chunk of people that aren't um, aren't walking at least once for 10 minutes or more. And if you look at the pattern at, at the top, it's even more intriguing because look at the 2019-20 data where we had the highest proportion of, of, of people that weren't walking at all. But we also had our highest proportion of people that were doing a lot of walking. And that's an interesting split straight there away, isn't it? Those that could did more. And, and, you know, we some of us may have had recollections of how much, you know, I had two kids at home for, for 12, 12, 12 of those weeks, I would have thought. And the only thing we could really do together was go out and have a walk for an hour, because that's one of the things that we were told we were allowed to, you know, the only reason we could go out the door. So there's some of these really interesting nuances of the pandemic at play in all of this. What's interesting, though, is that bounce back in inactivity that we saw on the on the second slide. We also saw it in terms of walking and, and that not walking group bouncing back, which is a good place to start from. Um, let's just start to look at this in a little bit more detail across different groups in our community. I'll explain some of the groups first, if that's OK, before I go into the data, um, because there's some labels on there that come from the data. They're not language that we'd use, but they are accurate to the, to, to the data. So NSSEC 6 to 8, second from the left, what does that mean? Lower socioeconomic groups. Are, uh, NSSEC is um, the way that the census puts people into socioeconomic classification. It goes from one to nine. Nine is basically students and no and everybody else that they can't get into one to eight. Um, one and two are higher socioeconomic groups, more like, well, they're likely to be chief executives or senior people in larger organizations, professionally qualified people like um, lawyers, accountants, um, and, and so forth. Um, and then an SSEC three to five are middle socioeconomic groups, middle management, lower management, people with technical qualifications, technical jobs, and then lower socioeconomic groups, people in routine and semi routine work, cleaners, shop floor workers, uh, retail work, um, and then NSSEC eight is long term unemployed, uh, long term disability. Okay, and what we know is in um, not walking is higher amongst those in NSSEC six to eight because it's up 46% up of that group. But bear in mind, there's an interesting thing here that we need to be conscious of. People in lower socioeconomic groups are more likely to be in manual work. 
and manual work minutes are not counted by this data. So we just need to be conscious of that. Limiting illness, well, it is it's limiting illness, disability, long term conditions. It's those people that when they complete the survey, they identify themselves as a, of, of, of having one of them. All of those, are, 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 all of the others, I think, are, are fairly straightforward in terms of, of the description. Now look at the pattern. You know, we've got those that are, are, that have a limiting illness or disability with with the highest rates of, of not walking. Then our lower socioeconomic communities and then our diverse communities. OK, we can't at, a, at an error wash level, we can't break diver, that, that diverse community down any further than that, sadly. Um, what I can tell you from a Derbyshire um, level is that it is our black and Asian communities that have higher levels of not walking. Um, compared to white or the white British and, and, and so forth. Um, but the the sample at an error wash level isn't big enough for us to to kind of um, pull out any meaningful data beyond everybody that's not white British, sadly. Just moving on to look at the trends. So you're looking at the trends here now for those that are not walking. OK, and if we just start to look in the middle, if start with NS, lower socioeconomic groups, NSX 6 to 8, it was heading down a little bit then the pandemic pushed it up but it's bounced back which is positive however it's still nearly half of those communities that are not doing a single session of 10 minute walking okay limiting illness it's over half that that trend has got down pre-pandemic the pandemic has really pushed it back up and it stayed up and we're over half of that part of our community that are not getting 10 minutes or more now that 10 minutes is a bit arbitrary We've selected it because if you um, if you're a bit weird like I am and you can remember the detail of chief medical officers recommendations that you'll remember a couple of years ago, the, the evidence was that it had, bouts of activity needed to be 10 minutes or more for us to get the health benefit that has now been dropped from the chief medical officers recommendations. It's any minutes. Um, however, we thought we'd use that as a way of just trying to analyze the data to make sense of it a little bit. Then you've got some really quite interesting patterns. The, the other one that I'd like to point out is young adults, because young adults, 16 to 34, are often one of our more active groups. And yet we've got four in 10, you know, around the average for, for the whole population that aren't doing any walking. And that's part of to do with something that I explained earlier, which is they're more likely to get minutes from elsewhere. They're more likely to get minutes from traditional sport, gyms, fitness, cycling, et cetera, et cetera. Just going on to um, onto the next slide, um, we've looked at the, the demographics data in a slightly different way. We've had to aggregate the data to be able to do this. So add up all the six years of data on top of each other to, to be able to break it down here. And, and I want to observe this point around people not in employment, unemployed and how much higher uh, people uh, you know how much there's a higher proportion of people that are unemployed that are not walking for 10 minutes or more which is a really interesting um, um part of the data um students when i was talking we were talking um in south derbyshire this morning students was really high there it's not in in error wash which is which is interesting um however i would just keep that in mind that kind of pattern with that younger people trend being you know being what it is especially when I get into the data in a, in a little bit more detail shortly we've also just um, looked at this data from a deprivation so we've used IMD uh, indices of multiple deprivation it, it tells us how it gives a kind of ranking to how deprived around income um, qualifications access to services different communities are um, it breaks it into 10 different deciles. We can't get the data for those 10 deciles, so we put them into four groups, into quartiles. And what this shows, interestingly, it's a bit more of a mixed picture here in Air Washington than it was in South Derbyshire, but we've still got that our most deprived communities are likely to have higher proportions of people that are not walking at all. Um, um, but but the, when it comes to walking you know, regularly, relatively robust, in that in, in our more deprived communities, which is an interesting dynamic, isn't it? How can we have more of the not doing anything, but a relatively comparative, a similar amount of people that are doing a lot? And that's about habit, maybe about routines, about work, about accessing public transport, potentially in, in some of these communities. All of those factors will be at play, I would have thought. And then when you get into the other, well, it's a little bit more mixed up than, you know, there was a very, you know, step by step, 
getting lower at the bottom pattern when we were looking at this in South Derbyshire, it's a bit more mixed up in Erewash. So trying to understand why we might have that would be an interesting conversation I'd like to have at some point. Just going in a bit to a bit, you, you, you're going to have to stick with me now. I'm going to get quite detailed, and but there's some good stuff coming. Really, hopefully, you might think, oh, you might think, God, this guy's a bit weird. But there we go. We'll find out at the end. Um, just getting in. Now, the data that I'm looking at now is is people. It's just the people in low socioeconomic groups. So at NS628, I hate that term, but low socioeconomic groups. So we're looking at our lower socioeconomic community. And within that, who's more likely to be not walking? Look at the young adults. Look how high that is amongst, and how small the green bit, the regular walkers, is at the top. So this is a group that's very active. You know, generally, this is if we were to look at this for inactivity across uh, NSX six to eight or across lower socioeconomic, this group would usually be one of the more active groups. And but they're not walking. They'll make up a big that twenty eight percent that I pulled out at the beginning on that second uh, third slide. These, these, this part of our community will make a big group up of that. They're active, getting minutes, but they're not getting them through walking. What are the implications for that? What does that mean for the way that we look at our communities and, and move around our communities? Then you've got men, which is another interesting group within there. And then you've got people with a limiting illness and, and disability. And how these groups cross over with each other, well, that just push up not walking even further. And so what is it that we need to do with our engagement work? Just look at how good the data is for the 35 to 54 year olds at the top. 22% of that group that are walking a lot. So how do we get to look at these communities that these, that the, these different groups that live within to see them through their eyes and see their life through their eyes as to why walking doesn't play the role that it plays for our middle aged adults in lower socioeconomic communities. There's something really interesting to try and get our heads around there and, and, and what that means. Um, I'm going to go into a few slides now. They take a little bit of explanation. You might not be able to see the pattern straight away, um, but let me explain them. So we're still with low socioeconomic communities. Let's start in 2015, 16, and, and I'll explain the towers there. So in 2015, 2016, on average, people in lower socioeconomic communities did seven sessions of walking for leisure, the light blue column, and they did six sessions of walking for travel, the dark blue column. OK, that's 2015, 16. So you can just follow now the session, the pattern in the sessions across all of them. If you're wondering why some of the building blocks are bigger than other building blocks, well, the depth of the building blocks relates to the length of the session. So in 20, so in 2015, 2016, if you compare those two towers to 2021, 20, yeah, 2020, 2021, you'll see that the depth of the block is very different. That means in 2021, when people went out, they walked for longer. So the session length has increased over time, both in terms of walking for travel and walking for leisure. But look at the number, the way that the walking for travel sessions have plummeted. People have stopped walking for travel and they're doing a bit more walking for leisure because that seven's the highest it's ever been. And we've had some seven sessions in previous years. They've gone out for longer rather than doing more sessions. So we've lost sessions overall but not necessarily minutes, but the minutes is an interesting one. I'm going to go on to that now. So another way of looking at that data is to look at the average minutes that we get. You can ignore the numbers a little bit because I, if anyone here can accurately predict exactly how many minutes they walk for every time they've gone out for a walk in the last 28 days, you've either got a really fancy Garmin watchy thingy, my Bob, or your memory is brilliant and you should come work for Press Red. Okay. We can't, we forget these things and the numbers will be a bit out. That's not what we're looking at. We're looking at the patterns. And the pattern here is look at how that walking for leisure has risen, especially from a low just pre-pandemic to what is now a high in terms of getting minutes from walking for, uh, walking for leisure. Now look at what happened, especially in the latest year of data to walking for travel. It has plummeted. So overall, we're getting a similar amount of minutes from walking, but they're coming from walking for leisure than they are coming from walking for travel. OK, I am going to go 
down a bit further now into communities and then I'm going to bring us back up if that's okay and I'm going to try and put out some of these bits of information together to pose some questions about what we might need to be thinking about when we go into this work. Okay you may have seen a map like this before this is basically inactivity so the proportion of people that are doing less than 30 minutes but it's modelled down to a, what's called a middle super output area what on earth is that it's a it's a uh, it's an area of land that has between five and 15,000 people living in it. And it's the way that the, the, the census data is organized. The darker the red bits and the orange bits, so these bits here in particular, the higher the level of, uh, of, of inactivity. The blue bits, the lighter and the darker blue, the lower the level of inactivity. OK, what this helps us to do is it shows us some parts around Ilkeston. I can't quite tell what the town is underneath that, so I don't know, but Jade will tell me. Um, it's Kirk Hallam. I it's Kirk Hallam. The red bits. Yeah, but, so we've but, got but, the, it goes just over the border as well. So I think the other red bits are just outside of Erewash. Okay. And so, so you can see that this suggests some areas where inactivity is higher, which is helpful, but not really helpful. They're still big patches of land, aren't they? <laughs> Five, fifteen thousand people living them in them. So how do we get into a bit more detail? Stick with me. What we can do with this data is we can use something for, that the ONS, the Office of National Statistics do with the census data, which is called output area classification. What on earth does that mean? So we all fill in the, the census. The, the Office of National Statistics put all of us into one of 75 little subgroups where we share like demographics. So it will say more likely to be in this age range, more likely to own one or more cars, likely to be living in terraced housing or in flats, likely to be on more likely to have a greater proportion of people unemployed. And it gives you a description of each of these 75 little subgroups. Those 75 little subgroups build up to 25 groups. The 25 groups build up to eight supergroups. You've got data on here for five of those eight supergroups. Why is this important? Well, we can follow this data and follow the data all the way back to very small areas of, 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 of towns and cities and, and rural communities. So, and we can show where the groups that are more likely to be not walking are living. So, Constrained city dwellers, remember that title, number seven, nearly five in 10 of that group are not walking very much. Look how small that little green sliver is at the top. OK, so this is a group, you know, it's getting on. Well, it's over 70 percent of this group are really not walking very much. Well, where do they live? Well, on here, if you remember, the title was constrained city dwellers. They're blue. So these little communities that are blue in and around Ilkeston, that's where our constrained city dwellers are living in greater numbers. I don't know if you also noticed, but the yellow is um, hard pressed living. Not walking was also high amongst that group. It was also high amongst the suburbanites. But we, the reason why I picked Hilkeston is the purple, the blue and the yellow have all got quite high levels of not walking very often. And this data can help us find, the, find those groups in the streets that they live in. So how do they see their community? If you go back to some of our conversation earlier about the need for planning and environment and the connectivity and green spaces and all. Well, actually, how do these parts of our communities perceive walking or not walking as the case may be? What is it that we need to understand to be able to see the changes in the environment that we want, need to create for everybody to be able to walk so that we can make better, more informed decisions of what that starts to look like. And we can use this data to get quite local and, and, and think about uh, get reaching into our local communities. I'm now going to throw something in from Greater Manchester. You might be sat there thinking, but we're talking about Wash, so why is he ch chucking something in here about Greater Manchester? Well, it's a slide that I was lucky enough to hear um, Nick from uh, TFGM present a, a few months ago. And when he presented it, it just helped me make sense of quite a few or make better assumptions is probably a, a better description of quite a few things. So let me just put the slide up for now. What this data does, it's from just before, it's the year before the pandemic, okay, 2019, December 2019, this, this was put, so literally four months before the pandemic. What this shows for Greater Manchester is for those people that walk, where do they walk to? What do they, are they more likely to walk to? 
And and in my head, when I saw that pattern around active travel that I've just shown, where all of those minutes have dropped and all of those sessions have dropped, in my head, I was my automatic reaction was it's work, it's people now not having to commute, travel to and from work, and that's why we're seeing that drop. Well, this would suggest follow the list down that actually not a lot of people walk to work. Actually, if you start to look at all of the other things that are above that, like going to green spaces, walking to and from primary school, places of worship, GP, pharmacy, job centre, banking, secondary schools, seeing friends and family, food shopping. All of these other places in Greater Manchester, people are more likely to walk to than work. So working patterns shifting is only one little reason why that active travel um, uh, situation has emerged. The bit that really struck me about this slide is when you read down that list, how many of those things have gone online? and gone online even more because of the pandemic. Going to the job centre, gone online. Going to my GP, gone online. Going to my, get my repeat pharmacy prescription, probably gone online, or it might have to do a bit in person. Food shopping, gone online. Going to other shops, gone online. These things are not coming back. These minutes are not coming back for some of our, our community. If you're young, if you're in that 16 to 34 age group that doesn't, doesn't walk, and you're re used to living your life online already because that's what you've been born and brought up with. Why do you care about going to see a GP? So, so, you know, quite comfortable that I can do my GP appointment online because it saves me having to get to and from the, G the GP surgery. But if you're of a certain age, I'd include myself, I was brought in this, I'm used to going and seeing my GP and having a bit of a personal relationship with them. I wanna go back and see my GP. So some, for some people, Plodding down to the GP every now and again might come back, but for others, it's not going to do. And some of these locations are not coming back. So we need to start thinking quite differently about the places that we pop to and do short walks to, and how connected those communities that I've just put you up with, put up with all of the that the those different groups that are, are li not likely to walk as much. Well, how connected are they to green spaces, to their primary schools, to, to some of these other places that aren't going? And how do we need to start to think about what this means to our to our 20 minute neighborhoods as a, as a concept? I mean, there was some really there's another slide that I haven't shared today that goes alongside this, which is um, which is around um, how long it takes the average journey time for each of these different journeys. Walking to and from university, so the one quite close to the bottom, university at college, that was the longest journey on average, 18 minutes. All the others were 15 minutes and under. So really, this time of 10 to 15 minutes is, is a maximum walking time that people are going to do to get to things. What does that mean for the way that we might need to retrofit um, <laughs> Ilkeston? Because we've got to start thinking about what it is that people do want to walk to and how do we enable that with the work that we do. One final note just on children and young people. Um, we the, There is a survey that collects data for us on children and young people's behaviour. It isn't the sample isn't as robust at a local authority level so we've had to do some analysis at, at a derbyshire county council level and why it says derbyshire cc um and i've only got one slide today there are in the pack that we will circulate afterwards there's a few more slides in there but i, I will explain everything that's going on on the one slide um since the pandemic walking once a week amongst children aged um five to 16 has gone up and has gone up big time we're about to get the fifth year of data in a few weeks. Oh, actually, this week. Be a happy new day today this week. Um, so we'll have another year of data to put on this soon. But the pandemic certainly pushed walking behaviour up. However, that walking behaviour is quite interestingly distributed. It's being driven up by girls and children from low affluence families. And it's girls in particular that have seen a really significant increase in the walking and and it's and, and I can actually narrow it down. It is across all age groups of girls, but it's being driven particularly by teenage girls age 40, 13 to 16, where it's, we have seen a massive rise in walking amongst that group. And yet, and their overall activity levels have also gone up because that's how big the rise is. And sport minutes from sport has continued to go down. So what's going on for teenage girls that we can learn about that we can think about how does that help us with other other groups in our community 
Now that spread in teenage that is that is that change in teenage girls across family affluence? Yes, it is. It's driven more from girls that are in middle and higher family affluence, but we've also seen positive change amongst uh, girls in low aff uh, affluence families. So we've got this really interesting thing going on that the pandemic has created where teenage girl or, or the pandemic has contributed to because we we think the trend started just before the pandemic. But there's something going on there that we might want to try and understand a bit more because it might help us think about how we create change for others. What is it that's happened? If you've got any thoughts on that, I'd love to hear them. So this is all of those kind of messages in, in, in a summary. I'm not going to go through them all again. Hopefully you've had a chance to take them on board. We will share the slides. I think there's a really important piece in this about us thinking about how our communities are changing. We're going to get some, you know, a lot of the new census information is coming back. So they're going to be uh, um, they're going to be uh, shifted demographically. We need to be thinking about climate change coming down. I haven't touched on any on anything around climate change at the moment, but this concept that we can all just move out of petrol cars into electric cars is not going to work. You know, the change that we need in reduction in driving is huge. If we're going to genuinely try and stick to what the uh, um, one and a half degrees, so we've got some big challenges, but at the same time, they're really positive challenges for getting people walking more. Have I missed anything, Jade and Heather? Any questions? Well, that's what I was going to say. You're only the only thing missing is uh, are there any questions? And I know that Kate put something in the chat around. Can you tell when when you're looking at those the walk into work's low? Can you tell if it includes walking, uh, driving to work, and then walking once you're around at work in the town? No, we can't. We can't look at the data like that. Sadly, it's really a frustrating. Yeah. No, the point I was trying to make was, um, although it does seem like walking to work is low, my question was, is that because of the lack of 20 minute neighbourhoods within residential areas, it might be that you drive to work, drop your car, and then from there you're able to do more walks to other places because you're you're suddenly in a neighbourhood where you can yeah. access the bank yeah. and everything. So yeah. if you if you were working from home, that might they might be hidden in that data. Yeah, they could be. Yes. Yeah, they could, absolutely, absolutely yeah. could. Yeah, yeah. I can't tell that. And I don't think we could from the GM data either if I could get my hands on it. But no, I it's just interesting how that. many of these things have knock-ons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other comments, questions? Um, <laughs> this, this, the comment about teenage daughters and social media, that was what, when, when we presented this in Greater Manchester, that was the first that I, I'm, I'm, you'll have to forgive my naivety, I'll describe it that way. Um, I'm not on Instagram. So when this was kind of explained, I was like, I, think, I just don't know what's going on there. But somebody was the first thing somebody said was there have been a lot of influencers. I don't even know what that means on Instagram that have been promoting walking because of body shape, which I, I was just really, really struck by. Um, and and well, there is something gone on because it's boomed amongst teenage girls. So it, it, what can we take from it? I, I do wonder. That is a really Scott, great point, Kat. Yeah, I, I was just going to ask you, Scott, then, actually, and you've you've kind of said it anyway, because GM seems to have a similar picture. But in the work that you've been doing across Britain, have you noticed that trend in girls? Yes, it's a national trend. It's, uh, so we've done we can share a pack on this, actually. Actually, you've already got it, Heather. Um, Ni uh, Naomi will have it. We've done a we've done an analysis of um of the national data around this to try and identify which groups of girls it was coming from. Because when we saw it, we were really excited. You know, if I go back to my old days in sports development, this was one of the groups of, of, of the population that I was trying to get to play more sport. And then something like a pandemic's come along and just done all the hard work. <laughs> but it's not sport. It is walking. Dance is the other thing that's gone up. Interestingly, dance and walking are the two active, active activities that have increased the most. So we have done an analysis of this and you've already got it. And if you're, you're more than welcome to share that with, with, on the back of the workshops with people because it will help just bring out that kind of you know analysis of what's happened amongst girls and walking safe space is a huge in that well safety full stop you know there was a great discussion this morning wasn't there about the lady reporting um from the ppg 
um, somewhere in, in South Derbyshire reporting why she doesn't walk. And she's like, well, I don't want to walk down the road with all of those horrible, noisy trucks along a really busy road, which has just got houses everywhere. It's just no interest to me. I'd rather get in my car and drive. You know, so what does it mean for how we change that? It's not easy, is it? You know, that's why we've got to get some of those planners and transport people and politicians in the room with us to be having this kind of conversation because we've got some money investment here to to learn, to really think about if we do this, what 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 happens? What can we observe? Brilliant. Thanks, Scott. I think Marie is typing something and then we'll. Oh, she stopped. Oh, no, here we go. Get back in. Yeah, that that whole campaign space, Marie, is a really interesting one, isn't it? Really is. And what does that look like for some of the groups and in parts of our communities? That's the bit that I'd get us to think about. And I think some of that might be better local causes, really local causes that mean people to something to people's lives. How can we kind of up the ante around getting your steps in to help them out? Great idea. This is something that we've talked about with our comms and marketing team, actually, about how we've talked about it with some of our um, walk leaders in, in each of the districts and boroughs about is there a local campaign in your area and is there anything that we can do to support it? So it is part of our um, list of things to do. But if you, anybody's got any ideas, then feel free to send them forward because we'd be really interested. I guess my final question then is, you know, this is me ranting at you with some national data that co that's collected nationally what what have you got locally what have, what do we already know to supplement this to build up a richer picture of walking and all its facets you know and you know, I, I don't know anything about housing developments you know it was mentioned earlier um you know what, where are the housing developments how can we use can we influence those housing developments to retrofit around some of our already urban areas so that we can get our walking experience better than it currently is in some of the communities where we know we've got a bit of a challenge you know, what are the other things that we know or could know that we could bring around this information to make it richer? Yeah, if anybody does have that sort of information, if you either pop it in the chat or if you send it to me by email, that would be really interesting because as as we move forward, I guess, to the next stakeholder event, we'll be looking at um, where Scott's data has taken us in, in our thinking, um, but what else we've got that either fills some gaps or complements some of that information that that Scott's been able to provide here and, and where do we really want to focus if we're looking at our inactive communities and, and what do we want to do with them I think. So um, that leads me fairly nicely actually into the next steps but while I'm I'll talk about it can I just ask Nikki to set up the final Mentimeter which is having heard everything that we've spoken about today and been involved in those conversations where do you feel that you fit into this work? Um, yeah, if you can get that up, Nikki, that'd be helpful. Can I just pick up on one thing? Because I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I should have remembered that, Jade. Thanks for the, you know, the, the, there is some work if, if and I know I, I recognise some names and faces around the all moving arrow wash work. Um, I think there's some connection there with the work that we're doing in that around trying to look at how to, you know, being active through the lens of people with different health needs you know that's what that works trying to build in so I think there's certainly some sharing of intelligence from what we've already got Jade to you know and it's certainly something we can pick up on some of the conversations that I've, I've got planned coming up as well so there certainly is a link there um you know is, are there other things like that that we need to be conscious of that's it it's interesting as well uh, Jade has got we had that discussion in our in our breakout room before as well how that all links together so yeah um yeah so if you can get the mentimeter up uh, how how do you feel that you fit into this work now that you've heard um the conversation and today maybe it's been your first introduction to walk derbyshire um maybe you already knew a little bit about it and maybe you knew quite a lot but has it has it changed the way you think about the work or inspired you in any way Saying in the work I'm doing in the ICB, really good and informative session. Uh, leisure walking, encourage people to follow their interests while walking. Yeah, 
be it a heritage sector partner, non-specialist voice to show how other people se- show how other sectors see this work and support it. Uh, walks for mental health, give you community connection. As an area wash resident, I'd be happy to be involved. That's really good to hear. Um, having experience of the issues and challenges, yeah, which is where our resident voice uh, links in really well. Uh, by continuing to program walk and learn courses that teach subject material whilst people walk, uh, having links with community groups and assets, yeah. Really good stuff. We're part of the system and have many connections of reaching to the community and voluntary sector. Yeah. Brilliant. I'm not sure if any more are going to come on and or if we'll be able to see them, but we will share the results of these Mentimeters after the um this is finished as well, so that people can see anything that, that wasn't visible on screen then. So yeah, the next step really is we are planning to have a face-to-face. Uh, stakeholder event stroke workshop on the 9th of January and it will be at EVA, Erewash Voluntary Action in Long Eaton. Starts at 12.30, I think it's three hours. Um, it's three hours or two and a half hours. It would be really great if everybody that's in this room here could make it and then if you have a little think about who isn't here that you think should be here and, and send on the invite to them and just try and spread the word a little bit. I think there will be a um limit to the amount, amount of people we can have in a face-to-face -face meeting but we can we can look at that as we get numbers in and the purpose of that will really to be thinking about the data that we've heard today the the local data that we can uh, get together and, and supply as a group and then where does it take us how do we involve and work with the communities that that we want to work with properly and make sure that they're involved in the process uh, where does it take us really so that's the plan for that um, I don't think there's anything more to say other than if you could send us some feedback about how today has gone, that would be really helpful. There is going to be a link in the chat. I think Nikki will put it in just to ask you how it's gone and then we can um, improve or change as we need to uh, as we go forward or keep it the same, um, obviously. Uh, yeah, th has anybody, cats? Anybody got anything else that they'd like to say before we finish? Jade? One day I will let everyone escape early. Um, it was just Heather, obviously, in terms of kind of growing that message ahead of the next stakeholder event in the new year, is this is going to be uploaded online, isn't it, as a recorded session as well as the yeah. slide. So if people haven't been able to make it and do want to come in the new year, um, hopefully they can listen back um, and have a little bit of an understanding um, as to what they're coming into and being part of the conversation. Um, if that helps. And Kat's popped a great question that I'll hand back to Heather to answer. The next session will have a little bit of a, a focus on the active neighbourhood pilots, yeah. So this work really is in a bit of preparation towards that as well as our other work going on. Um, yeah, when I uh, when we send out the, the recording for this, I'll put a link in for um, the booking, but I can't do that right now because I haven't got it unless Jade have you got a link Jade if you put a link into the booking and if you can circulate it um around your system partners that'd be really really helpful and I think the only thing to say is thank you very much it's been a really good session everyone's contributed lovely it's been it's been great and positive so thank you all very much yeah thank is the, you is the feedback link in there Nikki I just missed it. It is. I did put it in. Shall I add it again? A few, oh no, it's a there. Few comments yeah, don't worry. Afterwards. <laughs> well, thank you all very much, and have a good uh, rest of the afternoon and a good week. Thanks all. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Heather and Jade, I, I've just sent you the um, PDF of the girls. Analysis. Oh, brilliant! I, I should have mentioned that this morning. I completely forgot. Um, yeah, share share that as you see fit because obviously it it leads to walking. <laughs> so, and, and right, the change yeah. that's been happening around walking. So, um, particularly for that teen teenage um, age 